Sometimes the most golden Fox News moments happen when no one's really paying attention. Like this adorable little quip between Ainsley Earhart and Brian Kilmeade on Fox and Friends. Well, we always say that Dawn does the shoveling at your right, house since right. you work a morning show. Right. She hasn't made as much spending money because I know you pay her to do that. Right. Uh, yeah, because we but, haven't had any snow. But first, I'd like to see how she does. I don't just give right. her uh, money. Uh, well, the, so you review your wife's work? Yeah, and I have to do it through, through the ring doorbell. Have you so I could, I could have the money ready. Uh, which right. I think just got hacked. Uh, did you did see it? that? Yeah. Uh, mine? Uh, ring doorbell. Oh, just general? What? Well, we always say that Dawn does the shoveling at your right, house since right. you work a morning show. Right. She hasn't made as much spending money because I know you pay her to do that. Right. What? She hasn't made as much spending money because I know you pay her to do that. Right. What is she doing? Is she saving up to buy a mini backpack from Hot Topic? Of course, I like to see how she does. I don't just give right. her uh, money. He has to see the job she's done. Uh, well, yeah, so you're reviewing your wife's work? Yeah. Through the ring camera. Yeah, and I have to do it through, through the ring doorbell. For my garbage person of the week, we've got this guy, Andrew Bailey, the attorney general of Missouri, an all around horrible guy for a couple different reasons. The first, and I think the worst, is that you now, if you live in Missouri, you can go to this website. It's a fun website. You know what you can do there? Well, there's two things you can do there. There's what they want you to do there and what I would want you to do there. What they want you to do is to literally report people who you suspect might be engaging in a gender transition intervention in their language. Wait a second, hold on, I might have breaking news. Uh oh. No, John, oh God. I was worried, uh -huh. not you people, you're all good people. I was worried that a bunch of trolls were going to flood this website with nonsense mm -hmm. and make it impossible for it to do its job. Oh God, and it's already happened. Uh. The, the, the form is already off the website. <laughs> uh, it's so what bad. A stupid waste of government resources. No, and all these anyway, folks are no, like, listen, the government justice is actually. One of these former top uh, intelligence officials as private citizens wrote a letter that the, that these New York Post stories and a lot of the stories out there on Hunter Biden's laptop um, had the hallmarks of Russian disinformation and Russian propaganda um, and other media networks picked up onto that letter. And so that's what they are referring to here. Let, let me just say this first and foremost too. You know, at the time also that Blinken was having this conversation with Morell, they were both private citizens. Morell wasn't in the government. Blinken wasn't in the government. You, you hear Morell in his deposition saying he was never instructed or coerced or cajoled or even hinted at that he should write the letter. But Morell and other counterintelligence officials and other top intelligence officials, they wrote a letter. Um, there are about 51 of them or so or, or maybe more wrote a letter saying this looks like it could be Russian disinformation. And by the way, you know, Fox and all the right wing want to claim, oh, this is absolutely proven that it is not Russian disinformation. L let's be clear. I think what the facts have demonstrated is that clearly, uh, at the very least, that this laptop belonged to Hunter Biden. I mean, Hunter Biden filed a lawsuit against the individual who stole the laptop and the person who owned the uh, laptop shop, the electronic shop, who didn't have the right to take it. But the person who took it gave it to Rudy Giuliani and Rudy Giuliani's lawyers, and there was absolutely no chain of custody on this thing at all. And so with no chain of custody on this laptop at all, it's completely unclear what's real on the laptop, what's not real on the laptop. The bottom line is during this period of time, Hunter Biden was addicted to drugs. So the reality is, is he doesn't know what was on the laptop or not. But what we do know is that a chain of custody was not followed here. There has been no forensic firm that said there's an accurate chain of custody. So which videos are real, which photos are real versus doctored, which text messages are real versus which text messages are doctored. Could there have been information? But I mean, the reality is because of the way it's stolen and no chain of custody and Giuliani put it out and, and who knows what other people had it. No one knows the chain of custody of this thing, despite MAGA Republicans claiming. But at the end of the day, with all of this, like, who cares? The American people don't care about Hunter Biden's freaking laptop. I believe they paid this money because it was only going to get worse for them if they went through a trial. That having their anchors up on the stand may have destroyed that brand. And I think it was worth $787 million to Fox not to go through with a trial because it would have been even worse for them. If you look at the television ratings last night, Fox News did not cover the story, yet it got mm -hmm. its audience. They don't want to see mm -hmm. the story. They don't want to hear the story. They don't care about the story. They're going to watch Fox News no matter what. So that takes the threat of exposure in a trial, court of law, off the table because the Fox News audience is going to watch Fox News no matter what happens in the trial. Once Ruda, Rupert Murdoch was compelled to testify in a court of law, everyone knew on the inside this was going to be settled. Okay? He did not want to go in there. It was a personal thing. He runs that company. What he says goes. He told his lawyers, settle it, try to get the best deal you can get. And that's why it was settled. It had nothing to do with primetime talent. It had nothing to do with vision of what the image of Fox News is. He didn't want to go, so they settled it. He's a privileged man. Privileged people do not want to be in contentious situations. You know that. So well, he made I mean, the decision. Look, the he, it, he can certainly make it. He's in charge of it. And that's the decision that he made. Now, going forward, this has wide implications for the country that the country doesn't even know about. The big threat is the shareholders, the people mm -hmm. who bought Fox stock and now are looking at an enormous amount of money, resources coming out of that company, which damages mm -hmm. their shares. The debt ceiling battle started to heat up once again this week with Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, basically telling the Biden administration, we are not going to budge on making sure that low income Americans suffer. We're going to put work requirements on SNAP benefits. We're going to put work requirements on Medicaid, even though statistics already show us that those on those programs who are able to work, an overwhelming majority of them already are working. But putting the work requirements on there because Republicans want to change what able-bodied means, 
would in fact kick millions of people off, including millions of children. So that's the Republican plan. The ones who want to make poor people suffer immediately right now are the Republicans. And Kevin McCarthy spelled it out for the wealthy elite. He went to his audience, that New York Stock Exchange, and he flat out told them, I'm not going to let them raise your taxes, which are costing us $163 billion a year from the 2017 tax cuts. Instead, I'm going to make poor people go hungry. I am going to take the food out of the mouths of starving children to protect you, you good for nothing Wall Street bankers. That's what Kevin McCarthy did this week. Those are the people he's taking care of. And this SOB is going to hold the entire U.S. economy hostage unless he's allowed to make poor people suffer even more. Flying on a private jet is like cocaine. It is the, it is the coolest method of travel I've ever experienced, and, it, and, it, and it's tough, but I'm kind of having a moment with my jet, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm really seriously considering selling it because I'm, I'm challenged to square my, my concern about the environment uh, and, and my place in, in, in mankind to continue to be so phenomenally selfish to be able to get on a jet all by myself, for room for seven or eight more people in there. I'm in there all by myself except for the pilots. And it, I just don't think it's right, and uh, I'm, 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 I've got it for sale, so we'll see. Okay, like, um, small amount of credit. Why are people clapping? Like, he still has it. He's still using it. All he said was like, I'm starting to feel like this is a bit too much. People are like, yes. Yeah, no, this is not the end of the movie slow clap or whatever. The dude's gonna put down the mic, drive his fancy car to the private airport and get back on the plane. Like, maybe he'll give it up. You didn't think about the environment when you paid that much for the jet? <laughs> like, right now, like, you, you just, it just hit you at this summit. You just realized what kind of damage you were doing and how selfish you were being? Come on, guys. Like, listen. <laughs> Even if he sells the jet, guess what he's gonna do? He's still gonna lease one because he's not gonna fly commercial. He's not talking about buying a ticket or getting a membership on Southwest. That's not what we're hearing right here. Trust me. Yeah. I got little, I have little credit. The fact that he got a round of applause for this is where we are in this country. People are looking <laughs> and people are really being celebrated for something like you said. This goes back to the charitable thing. That you're not being charitable when you're talking about selling or thinking about selling your private jet. Tell us, like, I mean, really, the idea of having or giving all your money when you die makes no sense to me. Okay, you got $56 billion. Keep one. What imagine what change you can make in your life with $55 billion. Yeah, That's the type yeah. of thing. This country used to tax people. Everything over, I think, a couple million dollars was taxed in the 40s at 90%, bro. 90%. And now we're down to 3.4%. That's why, that's why our deficit is expanding. This is why we this is why we owe so much and why our social net safety net is crashing. I love the idea of a guy like reclining in his massive seat. He takes the last bite of his creme brulee, sip of champagne, and thinks, Am I the baddie? Back in 2014, he did an interview with Forbes and he bragged about the existence of the mine saying, this is gonna sound slightly crazy, but my father also had a share in an emerald mine in Zambia. You said it, buddy. Now that's not the only thing. He also talked about the private jet that used to fly around, you know, regular guy stuff. But he was the one that launched the rumor. Now, if you go to search for this article, it's no longer available on their regular website. It was taken down. There's never been any explanation as to why it was, but I think we can kind of guess. It is still, still however, available on the internet archives. So you can see it there. Also, by the way, he used to routinely tell an anecdote about how he sold some of his father's emeralds to Tiffany and company while his dad was sleeping. See, that article proves two things. One, that there were emeralds and that he profited off it. And two, that when he was younger, he was John Mulaney. <laughs> People accessed less misinformation in the 2020 election than the 2016 election, although it is not by any means game over for misinformation. But the, uh, the study was published just last week in uh, Nature Human Behavior. It found that just 26.2% of Americans were, quote, exposed to untrustworthy websites in 2020, which was down a good bit from the 44.3% in 2016. BuzzFeed reported that the tw top 20 fake news stories on Facebook outperformed the top 20 real news stories in number of link clicks in the final three months of the 2016 presidential election campaigns. So this wasn't just muddying the waters. They were generating more attention than the real news updates. And the most popular fake news story in the final three months before the election was titled Pope Francis Shocks World, endorses Donald Trump for president, released a statement. It had around 960,000 engagements and it of course wasn't real, but it was just game on. You could you could spread any BS headline, any BS website and uh, people were eating it up. Thank our Lord, Mark Zuckerberg um, for sort of maybe a little bit kind of, but not really clamping down on some of the fakest of the fake stories, but still keeping all the, you know, the like extremist far right wing stories. Cause obviously, you know, that's the good clickbait. They say efforts to educate people about the risk of misinformation, uh, including content labels and media literacy training, most likely contributed to the decline that they found. Nearly 68 million Americans still visited untrustworthy websites 1.5 billion times in a month though. So still an issue. And according to the researchers, conservatives and older adults were still the most exposed to untrustworthy sites in 2020 as they were in 2016, but they are now coming across them at lower rates. Um, you can look at the 37% older than 65 that visited misinformation this time around, a far higher rate than younger groups, but an improvement from the 56% in 2016. So even then, they're the hardest hit right now. The thing I'm really concerned about with this, Laura, is that the left becomes a turnout machine with young people because influencers have this domino effect, lemming-like effect of people just all them wanting to be part of the same crowd. And if they succeed in that way, uh, we're not doing a great job competing for ballots. We're just competing for votes. Kellyanne Conway 
Conway here is implying that Gen Z voters aren't voting blue because they believe in abortion access, stricter gun laws, voting access, or not banning books, but rather because they want to be in the in crowd, like they're still in high school. Yeah, that's a smart tactic. Kill them with condescension. Our candidates lost the early voting miserably last time. I mean, someone like Dr. Oz lost the early vote to John Fetterman by over four to one. She couldn't believe that John Fetterman, who has political experience and campaigned across Pennsylvania, was able to beat a former snake oil salesman on TV. She doesn't get that maybe young voters don't want anything the Republican Party has to offer because the party denies their lived experiences all the time, their biggest generational struggles, and then tells them they're too naive to know what's good for them. So maybe when Biden invites TikTok influencers to become a fourth estate in their own White House press space and to potentially follow him on the campaign trail, Gen Zers are gonna feel heard. Wow. And they're never gonna stop calling out the BSers. That the White House is reportedly in talks with. Republicans have no policy to help young people. That's my TikTok on Fox News. Did they actually think that Gen Z, the digital generation, wasn't media savvy enough to catch this? <laughs> well, it's just, you know, Harry and I do this because we genuinely believe in it and we like Joe Biden. I don't really need to comment on your weird propaganda network. Uh, how's that Dominion lawsuit going, by the way? Good? Oh yeah, and good luck in 2024 when you inevitably get crushed. Yeah, Gen Z will call you out. God forbid young people have ideas. Maybe if the right paid a little more attention to those ideas instead of using young tone-deaf grifters to cheerlead corporatism over human lives and troll college campuses about wokeism. I'm not sure at what benefit it is for parents to send their children to university anymore when they come back and they don't even know anything about their own genders. They come back dumber than when you sent them, right? Because they, they see everything as a buzzword, everything as a trigger, and in the end, they end up as non-productive human beings in society. Nobody wants to hire these people, these people that are just sensitive crybabies. Maybe if they talk to Gen Z like the future leaders of America that they are, instead of literally being a how do you do, fellow kids, meme? Then they just might get Gen Z's attention in a positive way for once. But don't count on it. Hey guys, it's Leah Cover. I'm back and I'm glad to see you guys again. Thanks for watching. Check out some of my other videos on The Breakdown, if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video.